let's open with the definition. According to the computational intelligence of Wolfram Alpha, the differential equation is exactly what it sounds like. It describes the relationship between a function and its derivatives. Of course, with a definition that vague, it should come as no surprise that the relevant nomenclature here is incredibly broad in scope. The good folks over at Brilliant have written some articles in this vein, so I encourage you to take a look at them. For the purposes of this video though, we'll be concerned exclusively with ordinary differential equations. And now is as good a time as any to emphasize that while there are a vast body of solution methods to draw from, differential equations are genuinely challenging in nature. Just the other day, for example, I was interested in what the literature has decided to call iterated functional differential equations. Essentially, I was curious about functions whose nth order derivatives corresponded to n compositions of itself. While what follows is a story for another time, I can assure you that there's no dirt of creativity involved in solving differential equations. But really, beyond a demonstration of problem solving, people are interested in studying differential equations because of their ability to model real-world phenomena, like fluid flow or population growth. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. Instead, consider a hypothetical population of creatures we'll call blobs. Okay, so we're going to create a square boundary and neatly arrange 100 blobs, each with their own velocity vector. Now it turns out that one of our blobs isn't feeling so well, and has a 10% chance of infecting neighbors that enter a certain radius of infection. Now as I start to meander which way in that, as all blobs do, let's go ahead and zoom into our initial infection. As we get familiar with the mechanics here, we can move into the big picture, graphing the infected population against time, plotting a new point every second. What we'll end up seeing is a sort of S-shaped curve. Now the question here is how we can reasonably go about modeling the dynamics at play here. After pondering the question, maybe you reason that it would be more fruitful to note that the rate of change of the infected population is related to that very population. Inspired, you head on over to the CDC and discover three factors involved in the transmission of disease. You jot them down and turn them into the following statement. The rate of change of the infected population equals the infected population multiplied by the average number of non-infected people they meet, multiplied by the rate at which they transmit the disease. Simplifying the equation, we're armed with a differential equation. At this point, you start to consider what this equation even means. Looking back in Calculus 1, you remember that one interpretation of the derivative is a tangent line. So you start to drop some axes and create a certain lattice of points. You can attach a vector indicating the tangential slope at that point. Scaling things down a bit and letting color stand in for magnitude, we can notice a few things. For one, there's a sort of symmetry within each column of arrows. That, of course, is purely a consequence of our differential equation. It doesn't depend on time. But more so, you can witness the beautiful crescendo that emerges from flow. As a quick sanity check, you can notice how the path traced by a point guided by these streamlines resembles the S-shaped curve our simulation showed. But what we just stumbled across with the dot and path is intriguing. It seems that rather than guessing at a solution curve, we can generate a reasonable approximation. The simplest of these numerical procedures is called Euler's method. You start at some initial condition, a point, find the slope of that point, then move some tiny time step, in this case that happens to be one unit, to the right. And you can repeat the process with that landing point. If you prefer a more algorithmic view, try pausing the video and following the pseudocode shown here. But it feels like we can do better. You'll notice that if we actually draw up the analytic solution to this initial value problem, significant error is racked up near the middle. And this should be expected. When the infected population is small, the behavior strongly resembles exponential growth. In other words, the calculated slope is highly dependent on the population, which itself was an approximation from the previous iteration. In short, the error accumulates. This behavior, by the way, is typical of so-called stiff equations, and while using smaller time steps would address the error problem, it would also increase the amount of computation involved. 
At this point, you might consider a number of alternatives. Maybe you try normalizing the vectors so you only travel a single unit of length in any given iteration. That way, when the slope is really large and unstable, you take an especially conservative time step, and vice versa for smaller slopes. It turns out that one way to dramatically improve both the accuracy and efficiency of our algorithm is to leverage higher order methods. Consider Hune's method. It works by finding the slope at your initial point, using it to approximate the next point, and finding the slope at that point. But the key distinction here is that the direction we end up moving in is the average of those two slopes, this little red line here. Or better yet, take RK4. You start at some initial point and calculate the slope, which we'll call K1. After moving a time step forward in the direction of K1, you call the slope at that point K2. You repeat the process two more times to get K3 and K4, the only difference being that K4 is calculated a full time step to the right. Taking a sort of weighted average of these slopes, we end up with our next point. Sometimes you'll see this procedure summarized in a butcher's tableau. I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer to figure out the correspondence here. When I first encountered RK4, the question that immediately came to mind was why the seemingly random collection of steps is so unreasonably effective. Well, it's complicated. Actually, it's really complicated, but we'll wet our toes here. The first thing we need to do is shift our perspective on what these numerical methods are actually doing. Imagine drawing up a function and its derivative. From the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that the area under the derivative curve is the change in our function. So if we want to find points on a function using its derivative curve, that task necessarily involves integration. But when we can't do that analytically, we can fall back on approximations. In fact, Euler's method is the equivalent of taking a left Riemann sum. You find the slope at your initial point, you pretend it's constant for a time step, and multiply by a small dt to get the area of the rectangle, aka the approximate change in the function. In fact, the numerical methods we discussed previously are often called integration schemes for this exact reason. Hume's method, where we take the average of our two slopes, resembles a sort of trapezoidal sum. But for higher order methods like RK4, this geometric view proves less fruitful. Instead, we'll rely on Taylor polynomials. If those sound unfamiliar, I highly recommend watching 3 blue one browns 12th video on the essence of calculus. The upshot is that we can use derivative information to represent functions as infinitely long polynomials. So, for example, if we wanted to represent cosine of x as some polynomial, we need to find values for a, b, c, and so on. Evaluating cosine as 0, we find that a should be 1. Taking the derivative of both sides and evaluating at 0, we find that b should be negative sine of 0, and so on. This process can be compactly described as a Maclaurin series, and sure enough, as we add more terms to the expansion, our approximation approaches the cosine curve. You might see where this is headed. If we want to describe our function in terms of its derivatives, which aside from an initial point is all we really have to work with, a finite sequence of its Taylor polynomial tells us how we can do that. The only issue is that if we're constructing an algorithm to do this task, we need to be able to take derivatives programmatically. And while computer algebra systems, often abbreviated CAS, can do this, we might wonder what would happen if we replace our Taylor polynomial with a combination of first-order derivatives, sampled at different places and weighted accordingly. Whatever method we end up choosing, we want it to align with the Taylor expansion. In this case, if we tailor expand our second term and ignore the third order remainder, we can simplify our expression and play a little matching game. If we chose a equals 0.5, b equals 0.5, and alpha equals 1, we end up with Hune's method. If you were to continue this process to the fourth order term while accounting for the multivariable case, you can similarly validate the choices involved in RK4.
But for all this talk about numerical methods, sometimes, although rare, analytic solutions exist. And in the case of the one we developed just a few minutes ago, fancifully called the logistic differential equation, it has a relatively painless solution using a technique called separation of variables. I'll go ahead and write out the steps here. I was going to close here, but as is a common theme in this video, I started to think back to when I first encountered separation of variables. To be honest, I was somewhat unconvinced you could simply split and integrate. I mean, the derivative is an operator, not a fraction like Leibniz notation would suggest. Now honestly, this isn't a very hard issue to resolve. In fact, if we write out the general case, after some minor cleaning, it's clear that the integral on the left-hand side should be evaluated with respect to dy. And that's not because the dx's cancel out. It's more so a product of the fact that whatever function of y pops out of the integral, when we differentiate, it needs to be done implicitly because y is a function of x. This accounts for the dy dx term that pops up in our integrand. Anyways, rambling aside, I wanted to take the opportunity to look beyond separation of variables and into the more general case. I recognize that if you're in Calculus 2, what follows will likely make little to no sense. My hope here is that I can provide a mental scaffold that you can look back on when setting multivariable calculus later down the line. Okay, so it turns out that separable differential equations are a special case of a broader class called exact differential equations. Our case example will be the following non-separable differential equation. The basic problem solving tip here is that reframing hard problems as degenerate versions of even hard problems can be helpful. So in this case, I want you to imagine taking all these solution curves, maybe you think of these as approximations developed from some numerical procedure, and lifting them into the 3D world. We'll motivate this in a minute. Then if we set that very hypothetical 3D function we'll call u of x, y to a constant, which by the way you might think of as a plane slicing through the surface based on some initial condition, we arrive at an implicit solution. But the critical question here is how do you find u of x, y in the first place? Well, imagine we differentiate. Using the chain rule, this ends up being u partial x plus u partial y multiplied by dy dx. Now, a partial derivative from a computation standpoint means that we pretend all the other variables involved are constant. Alternatively, the graphical intuition here is that we're finding the slope at a point if we ignore one of the axes. Let's unpack that. So you're working with u partial x. Since you pretend y is a constant, you can imagine a slicing plane running through all the x and z values where y is that constant. The exact plane, of course, depends on your choice of y, but it's a slice nevertheless. Then, since we're differentiating with respect to x, what we're doing is finding the slope of a line if we nudged a little bit in the x direction and ignored y. In any case, you can notice that this equation is strikingly similar to our original setup. After playing a little matching game, it seems that we can just integrate to find u. Well, not so fast. Doing so would presuppose that u of x, y exists in the first place. Luckily, we have an easy check for this that involves something called Clairaut's theorem. Essentially, if a function behaves nicely, you can expect a sort of symmetry among mixed partials. Here, that means u partial x, y equals u partial y, x. It turns out that there's a nice geometric view of this fact. Just like a 2D curve can be decomposed into a set of lines at small scales, the 3D analog involves polyhedra. Now when we're talking about partials with respect to say x, what we just established is that we're asking for the slope of a line if you were to nudge a little bit in the x direction and ignore y. If we then take the partial with respect to y, we're now asking how that slope itself changes with a little nudge in the y direction. So here for example, the slopes don't really change. Now the key observation here is that if our surface behaves nicely, then it should exhibit a sort of path independence. In other words, that intersection point, whether it's lifted up or down, should be the same, whether I go a partial step in x followed by y, or a partial step in y followed by x. Since the z value changes the same amount from that same slope baseline we started with, it follows that the rate of change of the slopes across x and y must also be the same. If we can show that the mixed partials are equal, then we have enough information to conclude that u of x, y exists. And with that formality taken care of, we can solve for u of x, y by integrating u partial x or u partial y. Since we chose u partial x, we need to add a k of y constant of integration, because when we take the partial with respect to x, that k of y term gets eliminated, it was treated as constant. Luckily, we can solve for it relatively straightforwardly by taking the partial with respect to the other variable, in this case y, and finding the k of y that satisfies the known value of u partial y. And that's it. Take care.